All right, I will introduce um, the panel for uh, Literature Knows No Frontier. It will be Elif Shafak and in conversation with David Roche. Literature Knows No Frontiers. Literature has always been a bridge across cultures, languages, and ideologies, embodying the principle that creative expression knows no boundary, borders. This belief central to Penn's mission emphasizes that literature can foster global understanding and solidarity, even in the face of division and conflict. In today's world where identity politics climate breakdown, war, intolerance, and violence are pervasive. The role of literature in breaking down barriers among people is more vital than ever. This panel will delve into how writers can uphold this ideal, challenging ever increasing polarization and silencing of dissenting voices and creating spaces for meaningful dialogue, whilst also examining and challenging whether literature can always be a bridge. By celebrating and in promoting peace and understanding in a world that desperately needs both. David. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Beatrice. Um, welcome to a very special event on this final day of um, what is a very important annual get together. My name is David Roach, and I've worked in and around publishing for about 30 years uh, with HarperCollins um, and then book selling with Borders, Books, etc., Waterstones, uh, and the Booksellers Association of the UK and Ireland. Uh, I now chair London Book Fair, and um, I've just stood down as uh, chair of the writing agency, New Writing North. I'm a published author, and now I'm joining Penn's International, Penn International's Philanthropy Advisory Board. And this is my first Congress, and I've loved every minute, and I've made some very good new friends. Um, but do forgive me for my occasional naivety. Um, it's my absolute pleasure uh, to be talking today with someone I revere as an author, a thinker, and an individual. Uh, she's also a very good friend of Penn. Uh, uh, Elif Shafak is an award-winning British-Turkish novelist and storyteller. She's published 20 books, 13 of which are novels, and her books have been translated into 58 languages. She's won and been nominated for an endless list of prizes and awards, too many to mention here, both in the UK and around the world. Alif holds a PhD in political science and has taught at various universities in Turkey, the US and the UK, including down the road at Oxford University and St. Anne's College, where she's an honorary fellow. She also holds an honorary doctorate in human letters, uh, humane, sorry, of humane letters from Bard College and is a fellow and vice president of the Royal Society of Literature, also featuring among BBC's 100 most inspiring and in influential women. An advocate for women's rights, LGBTQ plus rights and freedom of expression, Alif is an inspiring public communicator, speech maker and storyteller, and twice been speaker on TED Global. She contributes to major publications around the world and has not only won many awards for her writing and storytelling, but has also judged numerous prizes, uh, including the Penn Nabokov Prize and has chaired the Welcome Prize. Earlier this year, Alif was awarded the British Academy President's Medal for her excellent body of work, which dem demonstrates an incredible intercultural range. On receiving her medal, Alif stated, stated, literature is a natural bridge builder. It connects hearts and minds, cultures and continents. I think that's something that we can all sign up to. There's so much to discuss uh, that's of interest and relevance to this room. Thank you so much for coming to speak to us, Alif. Thank you so much, David, for every word you said. It's, it's really, truly wonderful to be here and, and join you. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got about uh, 35, 40 minutes. Um, so 
We are going to start off by uh, having a quick conversation about Lee's new book. I'm sure there's no one here who would disagree with this. Always take the opportunity to plug your book. Um, and the, the rivers, it's called uh, There Are Rivers in the Sky. It was published last month, to much acclaim. And I know one will be surprised to learn that it's full of rich characters, important themes, and wonderful storytelling. The copy that I read was bejeweled with fabulous quotes from many admired authors, from Ian McEwan to Marion Keyes. And one of my, uh, another of my favorite authors, Colin McCann, I thought put it best when he said, Alif Shafak um, discovers the epic in the tiny, the global in the local, the love in the loss, and the history in the momentary. The book centered on three interconnected stories spanning two centuries with a backdrop that goes back millennia and covers genocide, the climate crisis, neurodiversity, inclusivity and tribalism, ancient Mesopotamian history, oppression, language and oral storytelling, amongst others. Uh, I think, you know, it's all grist to the mill for, for, for Penn. Um, and I wonder if, if we can start talking about the book. Uh, and, and I think all, with all the themes that are in the book, that will naturally segue into uh, themes that, that are relevant for this particular session, and then we'll throw it open to uh, questions from the floor. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, with, with pleasure. Um, I think I wondered if I could build an entire novel on a, on a tiny drop of water. So uh, at first glance, the, the book we are talking about, There Are Rivers in the Sky, might seem to be uh, more epic, if I may use this word, in the sense that it does span countries, centuries, and cultures. So the canvas seems to be quite broad, but everything in this book is actually structured and based on one tiny raindrop. And this is the story of three characters who seem to be completely different at first glance, but are connected in a surprising way. Two rivers, which are the River Thames and the River Tigris in the Middle East, and one ancient poem, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh. So three, two, one, and they're all connected via that drop of water. One thing I would love to share uh, with you, and perhaps we can talk about this, I am very interested in ecofeminism, the kind of feminism that connects the dots. I think we have entered an age, a moment in time, in which we cannot be single issue people. We have to connect the dots. And water, in so many ways, is the story of our times. It feels like, I mean, when we talk about climate crisis, primarily we're talking about freshwater crisis. However, it feels like we have too much water around. Right now, there are flash floods in this country, across Europe. Of course, there are sea levels rising. So um, it's easy to feel like there's an abundance of water. But the irony is, within the abundance of water, we are experiencing a scarcity of fresh water. And for those of us coming from the Middle East, this is not some abstract theoretical issue. It is an acute emergency. It's an acute issue. Uh, of the most 10 water stressed nations in the world, seven are in the Middle East and in North Africa. So our rivers are dying. Our rivers are drying up. And this has, of course, massive consequences for everyone, but I think particularly for women. Women all around the world are water carriers. When there's no water nearby, the distance that a young woman has to walk in order to find water increases, unfortunately, increasing the possibility for gender violence on the way there or on the way back. So all I'm trying to say is water scarcity, gender violence, racial inequality, regional inequality, these do not exist in separate boxes. I think they're deeply, deeply interconnected. And I felt as I was writing this novel, if we want to see how interconnected we are as human beings with each other, but also with nature, perhaps we should look no further than the story of a single drop of water. There's a quote uh, in the book that says, water is the constant immigrant, trapped in transit, never able to settle, which I think um, sums that up perfectly. It does indeed, because when we, for instance, when we talk about the river Mississippi or the river Gange or the Euphrates, we tend to assume that there's, these are different bodies of water, but actually it's always the same drops that have been circulating you know, again and again throughout centuries. As humanity, we haven't discovered new sources of water. So it's the same water that we're drinking in our glass, the same water that one of us might have cried as tears yesterday, the same water that we carry inside us. 
Um, and in so many ways, I think water is a mystery still. You know, it doesn't act in the in the way we expect it to act. It continues to surprise scientists. But as I said, I think it's in many ways it's the story of our time. There's a lot of um, writing in the last, particularly in the last decade, about climate crisis. Uh, and you think of the books like um, books by writers like David Wallace Wells, which which scare you with the with the facts. But I, it, the role of fiction is an interesting one. Uh, I thought your book actually explained everything in a different way, and and that whole thing of um, data you forget, but it but it's how you feel that you remember that I think fiction works so well. Um, I'm looking forward to re reading Richard Power's new book, which was out yesterday, Playground, and I hope it does for Oceans what um, what he did for Trees and the Overstory. Um, how do you think fiction can, can approach this in a way that nonfiction struggles to? You know, I really, really appreciate this question. Uh, and if I may share this with you, sometimes when at book festivals, literary events, it's usually male readers of a certain age who say this. They say, you know, there's so much happening in the world. I read about politics, I read about economy, finance, history, philosophy, the important stuff. Uh, but I don't read fiction, you know, I don't have time for fiction. But apologetically, they say, my wife reads fiction. You know, they, they always assure me that their girlfriend reads fiction. Um, and I really, really feel very sad when I hear this because I think inside fiction, uh, there is politics, there is history, there is philosophy, there is psychology, there is neuroscience, there is technology, but perhaps more importantly, there's emotional intelligence. And I don't know a single human being in this world who does not need to connect with their emotions. Whether we are politicians, dentists, designers, students, we all have to connect with our emotions, especially in this age in which we are experiencing how emotions shape politics. I think it's the age of angst, the age we're living in. Everybody is anxious. The only difference is some people are better at hiding their anxieties than others. That's the only difference. This is the age of anger, it's the age of fatigue, emotional fatigue, frustration, confusion, bewilderment, and all of that is very human. But if there's one emotion that really scares me, that is the lack of all emotions, which is numbness. The moment we become numb to each other's stories, sorrows, and we stop caring. And I think in that regard, literature is the antidote to numbness. You know, it helps us to care. It helps us to connect. It does have a power and, a, and an ability to rehumanize people who have been dehumanized, to bring the periphery to the center. Of course, as storytellers, we love stories. We dedicate our lives to stories. But I think we're equally drawn to silences. That's how I feel, at least personally. So there's a part of me that wants to understand whoever feels like the other, whoever you know, feels like their story has been silenced or erased and forgotten. There's a part of me that naturally, organically goes in that direction and tries to give more voice to the untold stories and the silences. And, and I... It's interesting you talk about the, the current times. I mean, the, the a lot of your writing and, and in this book as well, uh, there's there's a lot of talk about the mixture between Eastern and Western cultures. And I think you've described uh, uh, the perception that Eastern culture is, is described as liquid lands and Western culture is solid lands. But actually now we're living in liquid times. And uh, yeah, and, and, and it, it wasn't that long ago, actually. Uh, I think many of us are old enough to remember late 1990s, early 2000s was a time of extreme optimism. And back then, the biggest optimists were tech optimists, actually. And they would tell us that information was the key. If you could spread information everywhere, everyone would become informed citizens. And informed citizens could only make informed decisions. And therefore, we would all become one happy global democratic village. Uh, and back then, with good intentions, there was so much optimism in the world that I remember one young Egyptian couple, they named their newborn baby daughter Facebook. <laughs> you might remember six months later, a family in Israel, they named their third child Like. And I do think about those kids a lot, you know, um, Facebook in Egypt and Like in Israel. Fast forward, what kind of a world suddenly we are in right now, because it's not the world of optimism that existed when they were named. So I think we have, the, the pendulum has swung and we have ended up in the, in the age of pessimism right now. 
Uh, and I think it was so wrong to romanticize information. Uh, we should have heeded T.S. Eliot's advice. There is a difference between information, knowledge, and wisdom. They're completely different things. I think we live in an age in which we're bombarded by information, snippets of information every day. And the truth is, we don't absorb them. We don't register, we don't process, we just scroll up and down. And it's a waste of time because there's no real connection. So it's an age in which we have way too much information, but very little knowledge and even less wisdom. And I think our duty is to change that ratio. Let's deal with little information. It doesn't serve us good. It only makes us arrogant because uh, it gives us the illusion that we know. You can ask me anything, everything. If I don't know the answer, I can Google it. In the next five minutes, I'll be able to say a few words about that subject making me believe that I know something about the subject. As a result of this, I think what we have forgotten is to say, I don't know. Like when was the last time we ever said, I don't know, but I don't know was the beginning of philosophy. Many ancient Greek philosophers, they started from, I don't know. So it was a good point that we have lost. So I think if we can deal with as little information as possible, but instead turn our attention to knowledge and wisdom, I feel like it will be healthier. And I think for knowledge, we need nuanced conversations like these. We need to slow down. We need slow journalism, for sure. In-depth analysis, books. And then hopefully for wisdom, we need to bring the heart into the conversation because I think wisdom also requires an emotional connection, not only intellectual analysis. That's interesting, your, your um, view on, on sort of polarity there. Um, and, and my wife asked me to ask you one question because she, she's a primary school teacher. And she said, in, in this world, you know, when you've got J.D. Vance saying, if I have to create stories that American media actually pays attention to the suffering of the American people, then that's what I'm going to do. My wife said, how do I teach eight-year-old children what's true? What a, what a powerful question. And this is the challenge that's awaiting all of us in the next decades, probably, not only just now. But um, you might disagree with me. I find it very sad that oftentimes populist demagogues are much better than their liberal counterparts uh, at connecting with emotions, right? They directly speak to emotions. They speak to anxiety. They speak to fear. They speak to confusion. And so we need a new language. We need a new narrative. We also need to understand why these populist movements keep coming up again and again. Uh, of course, let's criticize what's going on for sure, but let's also try to understand the root causes because unless we focus on those root causes, this is gonna keep happening. I think it's a scary time. We need to find new language, new narratives. We need art, we need literature. We need, we need these cultural spaces. This is not a luxury. Uh, it's a pity that in this country as well, many politicians regard art as a luxury that can be discarded. It is not, you know, when you take away art and culture and libraries, when you don't invest at all, you're taking away any possibility for people from completely different backgrounds, including from more disadvantaged backgrounds to transcend those boxes that we are pushed into. You know, we need to give a chance for mobility, you know? Uh, and art is, is one of those bridges. So I, I think we need to focus on those root causes uh, and understand the where, where does the appeal of populist demagoguery come from, coming from a country like Turkey? Of course, this is, this is an important issue uh, for me as a writer as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a fantastic quote about how to uh, hold up those examples and, and, and what to take out of it. If I can, if I can um, read it out uh, from Alif. Uh, from populist demagogues, we learn the indispensability of democracy. From isolationists, we will learn the need for global solidarity. From tribalists, we will learn the beauty of cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism and diversity. With thanks to Khalil Gibran. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Khalil Gibran's words in which he said that he learned kindness from those who had treated him cruelly. Uh, not exactly like this, I'm, I'm kind of um, paraphrasing, but that's the essence, you know, how can we take those uh, emotions, seemingly negative emotions and turn it into something 
relatively more positive for ourselves and for our communities. Toni Morrison actually has this beautiful essay in which he says, sometimes I feel so angry because so much is happening in the world, all these injustices. But the next line of her essay, she says, I feel so angry and I go and sit down at my desk and I write. And I love that quote, you know, as simple as it seems, because, you know, what do we do with that raw energy? Anger is raw energy. Disappointment is raw energy. Can we turn it into something more positive, not only for ourselves, but also for our communities, for humanity? If I may add one thing, I mean, you mentioned multiculturalism, diversity. All of these words have now become negative words suddenly, right? It wasn't that long ago. You might remember Angela Merkel was giving speeches using the word multiculturalism, no longer. Nowadays, diversity is uh, treated as something to you know, belittled. Uh, and I think diversity matters. Again, uh, coming from a country that has never appreciated its own diversity. I think by losing that appreciation, we have lost a lot. But it has, I, I believe it also comes down to how we regard identity. You know, identity not as singular monolithic blocks, but identity as something more fluid, identity as something for mu more multiple. So uh, when I look at myself, of course, I'm Turkish. I feel very connected to the land, the people, um, but I also feel very connected to the Balkans. I feel very connected to the Middle East. There are always elements in my soul that I will carry with me from the Middle East. Equally, I feel European, you know, the values that I share, the journeys that I've made. I've become British over the years, and I would like to think of myself as, um, as a citizen of the world, as a citizen of humankind. Unlike, despite what politicians in this country have been telling us throughout this Brexit saga, they told us that if you're a citizen of the world, it means you're a citizen of nowhere. And I disagree with that, you know, you can be a citizen of the world. It doesn't mean you're floating in the air aimlessly. So all I'm trying to say is to, instead of thinking of identity as something solid, monolithic, perhaps to, to think of it as ripples in the water, you might have, you know, local circles, regional circles, and then the global circles of identity. It is possible to, to carry that and celebrate that multiplicity. Um, which I think fiction allows us, you know, inside the work of novel, you earlier asked me, I think there's room for multiplicity, there's room for pluralism, and there's room for nuance, unlike on social media. I totally agree. The, 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 it, within the book, there's also um, two very wise grandmothers. And, uh, and I thought one put it, put it best when they said, uh, talking about the Yazidis and, and uh, the sort of persecution that happens in, as a theme in the book, they vilify us not because they know us well, quite the opposite, they do not know us at all. And it's easier to vilify each other when we don't know each other, when we treat each other as solely numbers and when we generalize based on those numbers. But that's, again, that's where I think the art of storytelling can make a difference because I believe... It's silences that keep us apart. But when we read each other's stories, it's it's relatively easier to, to connect. If I may share my personal experience with you, I have many readers in Turkey who come from very different backgrounds and they grow up in houses where they hear all kinds of negative things, particularly about minorities. So the main minorities in Turkey being Armenians, Kurds, Alevis, Jews, for instance, if you ask their opinion in the public space about the minorities, they might tell you lots of stereotypes and cliches because that's what they have heard. Equally, they have grown up in houses that are quite homophobic or transphobic. But then they say, you know, many of these readers, they come and they say, you know, I read your book and this is the character that I love the most when I read the novel. And the character they're talking about is Armenian or Jewish or Kurdish or Alevi or gay or trans. And it really um, struck me, you know, it, it got my attention. How is it possible that people who are more judgmental in the public space, in the company of others, when they are reading a novel, they become a little bit more ready to open up their hearts and to connect. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's inherent to the art of storytelling. You know, we retreat into this inner garden, not in a selfish way, but in a way that allows us to connect with the rest of humanity. And then you suddenly realize the other is my brother. The other is my sister. You know, I am the other. So I think literature dismantles that polarity between us versus them. 
Okay, I think it's time to throw it open to the floor and take some questions. If you can just uh, say your name and your pen center when, um, and we do have microphones on the table. Excellent, there, thank you. I continue not to know how to switch this on on the fourth day of the conference. Is it working? Oh. Um, Liesl Gontals from Pen America. Alif, always a huge fan and like your readers in Turkey, I think I've learned so much about how I think about my own identity through your work. But I have a question for you. I wonder if you would talk more about your definition of ecofeminism, because I think increasingly, certainly what we see in the US, which is where I live, is a mockery and a silencing of movements that seek not to be single issue movements. So I think, for example, of the labor unions that have supported BDS campaigns and who've been told it's none of your business. I think about Black Lives Matter that took on a trans rights perspective who were criticized. So I'm really interested and intrigued by your idea of a notion of ecofeminism that connects those dots. And I wondered if you would say more about what that means for you. Yeah, I really, really appreciate your words. As I was listening to you, I was thinking one of the probably most inspiring or interesting episodes in this country's history was when a minor strike turned into support for LGBTQ plus rights. Mm -hmm. And the miners at the time did not say, right, did not say, well, we should only be talking about miners' rights because what we need to realize is everything is connected. And for me, what, what was an eye-opening experience was um, I lived in Boston um, for a while at Mount Holyoke and I just, you know, lock myself in this beautiful Gothic library and I immersed myself in the literature of African-American women's movement of 1960s and 70s. That was a huge eye-opening experience. People like Audre Lorde, when you read these women, Many of them being women, they were on the receiving end of patriarchy. Many of them being black, they were on the receiving end of racism. Many of them coming from poorer backgrounds or disadvantaged communities, they were on the receiving end of class hierarchy. And again, being LGBTQ plus minor uh, members, uh, they were on the receiving end of all kinds of homophobia or biphobia, etc. And so when they talked about power, they talked about power in a much more nuanced way than we do today. When they talked about identity, you read people, not like Audre Lorde only, but also James Baldwin, the way he says, you know, when you look at me, you don't see, you know, I, I'm more than what you see. You know, you know uh, I'm this, I'm that, I'm a mother, I'm black, I, I'm gay, I'm this, but I'm many more things that you might not be able to see at first glance. So coming back to Walt Whitman's saying, we all contain multitudes, that emphasis on multitudes, I think it's something that we're losing in today's progressive movements. This is my observation, but I believe we sorely need to re remember that. Uh, especially now because it's accelerating, climate crisis accelerating, inequality is accelerating, so we cannot just be separated into mutually exclusive boxes. I think it's better to, to remain connected. Okay, question just there. Oh, okay, thank you. So I'm Lucina, I'm from Pen Armenia, and my question kind of comes back to what you were saying earlier. In fact, uh, your books are among the most popular books in Armenia. And one of the interesting things that I have been hearing being commented all the time that you make them see Turkey differently and you make kind of build bridge, you help to build bridges between the societies. And this comes mostly from people like you mentioned, minorities in Turkey who are people who do not accept minorities, but after reading your books, kind of accept and understand them. And usually such comments in Armenia are also made by people who would look at Turkey differently. So my question, which is also asked, and it's not by me, like I have been hearing this question coming up in Armenia all the time. Do you write uh, literature, particularly, for example, Bastard of Istanbul, like books like, like do you write uh, also purposefully for building bridges, or it's not one of the intentions you have while writing? So I, I, I thank you. What a beautiful question. I really appreciate. 
Uh, and, and our connection means a lot to me. I mean, there might be people in this room who might not know this, but if I mention it very briefly, after writing The Bastard of Istanbul, I was put on trial for insulting Turkishness. We have this article in the <clears throat> Turkish constitution, which protects Turkishness against insults, even though nobody knows what that means. It was used against journalists, historians repeatedly, but not before um, against the fiction writer. As a result of which I found myself in a very surreal situation because the words of fictional characters were plucked out of the text and used as evidence in the courtroom. And my Turkish lawyer had to defend my Armenian fictional characters. And that madness, that madness went on for a year. Um, there were groups on the streets spitting out my pictures, burning EU flags and saying I was a pawn of Western powers. Um, and afterwards, you know, we were all uh, acquitted, uh, me and the fictional characters. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why I mentioned this, um, I, I wish I could say that was then and now it's uh, easier. No, as we're speaking, and of course, um, our, our wonderful um, president of the of the Pan International, uh, Burhan Sönmez, knows this better than any of us. There are so many cases in Turkey against so many writers and poets completely unfairly. And I think we, we need to keep an eye, you know, it's uh, on all, each and every every case. Um, I want to tell you that before I start writing a novel, I do not think about these things. If I were to think, to be honest, I would be, I think I would be frightened. That's the truth, you know. Um, so when I'm writing a novel, I try to stay inside a novel as long as I can and as, as deep as I can. And those fictional characters, they become my friends. You know, that becomes my reality. And I forget this so-called real world. When the book is over, then I hand it to my editor and then I can start having those panic attacks. But by then, by then it's too late, the book is born and it has its own life. So all I'm trying to say is, I think writers cannot and should not think about, well, how is this book going to be received? Will the authorities be upset? Or will readers be happy? Or will critics be happy? None of that is our business. The only thing while we are writing that matters is the story itself. All those questions can, can come later. So in that regard, yeah, I think I just follow the, the, the flow of the story. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Do we have any hands up? No? No? Okay, you have a leaf Shafak here and you have no questions. <laughs> Extraordinary room. <laughs> um, is there anything else that, that, particularly for this audience, you think that um, is relevant? I mean, I read your book. I, I was delighted to read your book twice, actually, and I got and, and I thoroughly recommend it. And the second time, I got slightly different things out of it. Um, there was there was one the grandmothers in particular. The second time, uh, there was there were, the, there's one um, a nine year old girl who's who's losing her hearing, and and um, and there's there's a moment where um, the grandmothers telling her about her grandmother and and um and the wisdom that comes through and the, and the girl has just the best line where she just says wouldn't it be great and we should absolutely be allowed allowed to have one hour with each of our ancestors to be able to talk to them about that they you know you you talk about parents uh potentially having having sowing bad thoughts and bad seeds but actually those generational that generational wisdom sort of comes from the other direction doesn't it yeah, I really, really appreciate. I, I'm, I'm very interested in, of course, family stories, but also family silences. And particularly any immigrant family or any family that has experienced some kind of complexity, displacement, when we look at their journeys, the elderly, the older ones, are usually the ones that have experienced the biggest hardships, right? But they don't talk about the past. It just sits inside their chest and they don't have a language even to talk about that. The second generation, they don't talk about the past either um, because they have to be forward-looking, tabula rasa, make a new beginning, find their feet, understandable, right? But that leaves the third or the fourth generations in these families who are now asking the deepest, the sharpest questions about their ancestral journeys, 
their family heritage, the collective, you know, memory. So you can come across young people carrying old memories. That's something that really fascinates me. I think in every family there are memory keepers. Um, if I may share this, I don't know if I, we have time, yeah. a few more minutes. In my new novel, there are three characters, as we mentioned, they're connected to each other as though in a water molecule. So that, like the three atoms, H2O, uh, there's my oxygen and there are the hydrogen atoms. One of those hydrogen atoms is a Yazidi girl, and she lives in a place in Turkey, which is called Hasan Cave. The old name is Kastrum Kefa. It's 12,000 years old. It had so much historical archeological value. And also it was incredibly important for eco-diversity, for biodiversity. If you go there today, you will not find that place anymore. It's inundated completely because the, um, the government insisted on building a dam, a very controversial dam that has the lifespan of 50 years, five zero. Um, again, coming back to that water scarcity, countries holding, you know, water for themselves. So it follows the journey of a Yazidi girl. And when we talk about Yazidis, of course, we're talking about one of the most vulnerable minorities in the world. Uh, the Yazidi lore talks about 72 massacres at least. Uh, I just want to briefly add that when ISIS launched their genocide in 2014, the very first thing they did was to kill the water. They poisoned the water first. The second thing they did was to kill all the elderly. And when you do that in a community like the Yazidis, where memory is transmitted orally, when you kill all the elderly, you kill collective memory. And then they kill the man and they kidnap the women and children. As we're speaking, there are still 3,000, more than 3,000 women missing. So my, my point is, uh, I, I think I wanted to, to, to try to write about this still going on genocide. It's still not over in that regard. Eric, smart question. Thank you, Eric. Tanya Tuma, Penn Slovenia. Um, I read not so long ago your book, uh, The Island of Missing Tree, Trees. And I was wondering this beautiful metaphor of a tree uh, growing from both sides of the Cyprus border. Two questions. First, uh, are you presenting this book also in Greece? Is it read in Greece? Mm -hmm. And how? what is the difference, how people, and do you think that such a book, which is beautiful, I must say, can um, can really also um, motivate kind of reconciliation, peace? Thank you. Really, really appreciate uh, this question. You know, I've been wanting to write about Cyprus for a long time. As you know, this is such a beautiful island with beautiful people, north and south, but I didn't know how to even approach I couldn't dare because, as you know, uh, this is a divided island along not only ethnic lines, but religious lines. The Turks on the one side, Greeks on the one side, Muslims or majority Muslims, majority Christians. So um, it, it is a very um, alive issue and it's an unhealed wound. And depending on whom you talk to, there are clashing memories. So how do you approach such a subject as a storyteller without yourself falling into the trap of tribalism, without yourself falling into the trap of nationalism or ultranationalism? I couldn't find an angle for a very long time. And it might sound strange, but I feel very grateful to this fig tree because it was the tree that allowed me to approach. And I wish you could see my agent's face when I told him, I'm gonna write a novel, there's gonna be a tree in it, and this tree is gonna talk. <laughs> And he didn't like it, you know, uh, it was a risk. It was a risk because if it doesn't work, the whole thing collapses. But I really, really felt very strongly the sound, the voice of this tree inside my soul day and night. And I decided to, to follow it. Um, all I'm trying to say is, I mean, when we talk about civil war, how we destroy each other, the hatred that we produce, of course, we're not only destroying ourselves as humans, but also an entire ecosystem. So it gave me a chance, going back to ecofeminism, uh, to, to talk about this. Uh, as with regards to the reaction from, from readers, it really has been incredible, incredibly heartwarming. I received lots of letters from both Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. 
just yesterday, a Greek Cypriot reader uh, asked me to sign a book, and she said, I'm going to send it to a Turkish Cypriot. So these things are incredibly important for me and very, very heartwarming. OK, one. Sorry, yeah, I do have a round of applause. <laughs> we have one question there. We have one question there. Hello, um, I just really was amazed when I heard the story because when I was a child, um, we wrote this tale um, with my father. I was only 12 years old and it was a story of Greek and Turkish children on either side of a wall. And they spend the story trying to decide what to do about the wall. There's an eagle guarding it and the eagle's attacking everybody. And they decide eventually to water an olive tree with its roots uh, underneath the bricks and the tree grows to break the wall apart. And it's really something that we had a play with Greek children and Turkish children come on and act on stage. And I really love this fictional element of walls being broken down by nature, by trees. But, you know, Maypri as an activist thinking of Penn International, I'm just thinking of how we can, you know, kind of water the olive tree? How, in your view, is the act of watering olive trees work in our world today? And how can we try to break walls through that? Thank you. What a, what a beautiful question, Ege. Thank you so much for, for, for your words, your thoughts. Um, you know, one of the things that really inspired me and shook me as I was writing The Island of Missing Trees was a committee working on the ground right now. It was established by the United Nations, but it's the Cypriots, it's the islanders who are doing the real work. Uh, it's the Committee on Missing People or Missing Persons. Um, so it, it, what they are doing right now, and, and both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, they come together. Many of their members are women. Many of their members are young people and volunteers. And they're digging the ground in order to find the, the bones of the people who went missing during the time of the Troubles. And the reason why they're doing this is not because they want to revive old animosities, not at all, but they want to give the dead dignity, a proper burial, the, fam the families a, a possibility for closure, and the communities a chance to heal and grieve together, mourn together. I think this is very important. Now, we come from a country that has a very rich history, Turkey, but that does not translate into strong memory. If anything, I think Turkey is a country of strong, sorry, collective amnesia. Not strong memory, but collective amnesia. And we cannot learn from the past when we have this much amnesia. You know, when we have all these convenient forgettings, that is not helpful. So we need to be able to remember the past. History, the way it's taught to us at school, is his story, meaning the story of a few men, sultans, Sheikhul Islams. But the moment you ask, what about minorities? What about women? What about, you know, working class, people who have no voice? Then there's a huge silence. So my point is we need to take care of those or pay attention uh, to those silences, untold stories. Uh, we need to learn from the past, not in order to be stuck in the past. There are moments when we need to grieve together as communities so that we can build a better future together. But it's an uh, insult to say, okay, just move on, nothing happened. We cannot say that. So memory is a responsibility. And I think as storytellers, uh, it is our responsibility to be the memory keepers. Thank you. Um, okay, I think I think we're coming to the end, and and um, I thought that question was going to be going to be one about plagiarism. So actually, we have one more question. <laughs> you have time. Okay, go. Uh, hello, uh, this is from Pen Cyprus. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to give my testimony as uh, I was five years old when the invasion happened and then the division and everything. But I have to say that uh, the people have no problem with each other. Sure. They have not. Sure. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, we never quarrel. I mean, it, considering that in 2004, uh, the checkpoints opened and if you show your passport or your or identity card, you go to the occupied areas, okay? You can go. And the Turkish uh, and the Greek Cypriots, they go to and see their houses where Turkish Cypriots uh, out of the situation live inside. And they both sit there in the yard and, uh, and talk about the, the calamity that has happened. And never once since 2004, a fight was there. I mean, 
they go to their houses, other people live in their houses, and they don't fight. So it's very important to, to, for me to say that it's not about the people, it's the geostrategical uh, position of Cyprus and the, the, the interests of the great powers that uses people as an excuse to, give, uh, to keep Cyprus divided. The people have no problem with each other. Yeah, we I re we really appreciate that you 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 mentioned this, and of course this is a big tragedy and irony of of particularly our geography, isn't it? I mean the Middle East, the Levant, I would include the Balkans. Uh, oftentimes the people are far ahead of their governments, far ahead of their politicians. Uh, maybe they don't have the power to change those structures, but they are much more open-minded. And that's, that's, that's the tragedy. So people to people, of course, heart to heart, uh, there's no problem. However, there's also a recurrent pattern of ultranationalism and hatred as an ideology that is being also reproduced on a rhetorical level. And so I think it's very important, your work is so important, how do we dismantle that rhetoric uh, I, I think it's something that that we need to pay attention to. So thank you for sharing. Okay, if we can, if we can, can I end on a request? And that request is um, to ask you. I mean, the, there are eighty countries or so represented here. Um, many, many writers and, um, and and everyone connected with a Penn Center in in the, all of those countries. I, I, in my first conference, I, uh, Congress, I, I've witnessed incredible courage and dedication. I don't suppose that anyone needs any more encouragement, but actually it would be great to hear what Penn means to you and, and to give some words that, that um, get everyone fired up to, to go back to their countries and, uh, and, and do wonderful things. I no, really, really appreciate this. Earlier when we mentioned this uh, case years ago, I had um, my first encounter with, uh, you know, Pans, international pan, also English pan. I never forget the two of them were in Istanbul with me as I was attending this court case. At the time I was pregnant, so it was a difficult time for me. And it was a time when you felt, when you feel as an author, as a poet, quite lonely because there are lots of attacks from the press. At the time we didn't have social media, but you know, all over the press you are, let's say, called a traitor. The reason why I mention this is because this acute sense of loneliness. And as a writer, when Pan International comes and gives their support and solidarity, that changes everything. That means a lot. And I haven't forgotten that. And so today, when we talk about Jose Ruben, uh, Pan Guatemala shared it with us. It is so important. The work you do, uh, I have tremendous respect. And especially, it was always important, for sure. But I think it's becoming more and more important in today's fractured deeply polarized and, and bitterly politicized world. So all I can say is uh, more, more power to you. Your work means a lot to us writers and poets and translators and editors, but frankly, to every book lover and every literature lover. So thank you. I think that's a very important I can't think, I can't think of a better way to to finish. Um, um, and at the risk of asking you to do something you've just been doing for the last thirty seconds, can we have a huge hand and a big thanks for Alif? <laughs>